everyone, and welcome to Legislative Insight. I'm Margie O'Brien. It was just about a year and a half ago when Governor Gina Raimondo created the Justice Reinvestment Working Group to look at the state's criminal justice system. And we have members from this group, Representative Bob Craven, Senator Mike McCaffrey, and Judge Judah Savage. Thanks so much for being here today. So you got to work looking at the criminal justice problem. What were some of the big glaring problems right off the bat? Was it the number of people incarcerated in our state? I think one of the biggest problems was our probation population. Uh, we have the second highest probation rate in the country and about 24,000 people um, on probation, which um, means we could fill the Dunkin' Donuts Center twice with the number of people on probation. And within that probation population, um, one out of six are African Americans. One out of six African American Rhode Islanders are on probation. Um, one out of 14 Hispanic Rhode Islanders are on probation. So that was one big area to focus on. Um, we also uh, knew very quickly that what we're doing isn't working because 52% of offenders cycle right, right back in to the ACI after uh, release. And the other thing is that a lot of offenders need more services and everyone was recognizing that than they were able to access early on in the process. So particularly mental health treatment, substance abuse mm -hmm. treatment, uh, and the like. Did this come to a surprise to you? I think Agreed some you? of it was a surprise, but um, I'll tell you that <clears throat> probation, especially long periods of probation, with people that aren't getting any type of help or services, is almost an inevitable result. Sure. They can't stay out of trouble for 20 years. Uh, and it wasn't uncommon, I'm sure uh, the judge will tell you when she was on the bench, for uh, a prosecutor or a defense attorney to get together on a case that might be marginal in nature as far as the ability to prove the case, to give someone a long suspended sentences. And what was happening was most of the people, the vast majority of the people that were going to jail weren't going to jail as a result of trials. They were going to jail as violators. So they would have a long suspended sentence, somehow do something to break the law, might be minor, end up back in jail. And that cycle was believed by the committee when we reviewed it to be able uh, to provide some services and we could break that cycle up. And we also heard that the population of the prison, because of those restraints, was going to boom over up and through 2025, where they anticipated we'd be spending an additional $28 million a year for the prison population. That's really amazing. Now, I have to tell you, I spent a day at the ACI through a course I was taking, and we were able to speak to a handful of the inmates. The biggest complaint they had was that they didn't feel they were being set up to succeed. <coughs> they felt like they were being set up to fail because they didn't have the services in-house and also when they were leaving, they felt like they were going right back to the same situation. So how do we, as a state, is it about funding more programs in the ACI? Well, I think in the ACI and even as early as at the time of arraignment, we now have some really good data from pretrial services in the district court which provides some services. I come in, I'm a drunk driver, or I've had a domestic involving alcohol or the use of drugs. They're sent to get some counseling, to interact with anything from uh, a healthcare professional to going to AA meetings. Mm -hmm. And it has proven that, uh, that people seem to get the message at that point in time and respond to it. So from Pre, uh, from arraignment through uh, sentencing and even getting someone ready uh, for parole, if these services are introduced, I believe that the problem most of the time is drugs and alcohol. And most of the times, drugs and alcohol are from other un underlying mental health right. issues. If we can address the mental health issues that, uh, that the symptom, which is alcohol and drugs, get to the, uh, to the underlying problem, and I don't think it's going to cost a lot of money to do that, um, we can avoid the $28 million that, uh, that Chairman McCaffrey is referring to, and maybe then some. And you must have seen this on the bench, that people were coming in for some sort of larceny charge when it, the 
root problem is drugs or alcohol? Sure. I mean, the, the data shows that at least 65% of people in prison have a drug or alcohol addiction problem. If you add in the relationship between drugs and alcohol and what the crime may have been, we get close to 85%. The other thing about our prison population is that we went from 600 people at the ACI 40 years ago to 3,000 today. Even though our population in the state hasn't changed, and even though our violent crime rate has dropped 45%. So we've just over-incarcerated. And in order to probe that more, we're also finding that about 20% of the people at the ACI have a severe and persistent mental illness. Um, so we have turned the ACI into our largest state mental hospital. And all of this pattern is extremely costly. We spent $75 million on corrections 40 years ago, and now we're poised to spend about $225 million. So the question is, can those dollars be better spent and actually make us <coughs> safer at the same time? And I think people all over the country have woken up to this in a relatively short amount of time. Um, it was only 2015 that Justice Kennedy on the United States Supreme Court uh, went out publicly before Congress and said, this criminal justice system is broken. And I think a lot of us, even within the system, um, didn't see the big picture of what it looks like because you spend every day case after case. So we've, we, you're looking at the probation. What is the solution? Well, I, I think it, it was good to see they had all branches of government involved in this. You had the yeah. executive, the legislative, and the judiciary, as well as in the legislation that is passing and come out of the commission, provides for at the initial, before the arraignment, for some screening to be done. And in the case of someone needs mental health counseling, they'd be able to, the police would be able to take the person from the police station to a facility to address that. In addition, they're requiring that the courts be given, before they impose a sentence, a, treat, a, a report that says, this is what the issues are, so that the judge in handing out a sentence can determine, one what, really, you don't belong at the ACI. Maybe you belong in some intensive treatment program sure. to address your issues. You know, Margie, the ultimate goal of, of punishing someone or adjudicating someone in a criminal case is twofold. Uh, it's to punish someone and it's at the same time to rehabilitate them. So you gotta pay a price for your crime and be rehabilitated. But if you, from, from the Chief Justice of the Rhode Island Supreme Court to the beat cop in Providence, they tell you a success is when this person doesn't come back, when they've, when they've essentially seen the light or they're cured. And you can't do that the way we're doing it now because it, it's getting worse instead of better. So if we can get to the, to the grassroots problems and give people some skills, I think that uh, I, I think we'll be we'll be much more accurately heading towards that goal of a lack of repeat offenders. When we were talking to the inmates, three out of the five women said this was their third time in, and that they were convinced they'd be back because their family. One woman, she said, "My husband's here, my mother's here, my uncle's here, my brother's here." It was all they knew. They didn't know how to get out of this mm -hmm. cycle. But she said, for the first time, I'm finally getting help for what my problem is. She said, I wish that I had done this before. I mean, she had been in for, you know, a lot of drug-related crimes, mostly stealing. But she said, if I had found out that I was doing drugs in the first place because of this, I could have gotten help. And it is looking at each person mm -hmm. individually. Right. And it's a vicious circle. They're stealing to get the money to keep their habits going, a lot of them. Right. Yep. And hopefully this will address some of those issues there. We changed sentencing and things of that nature, and the courts took, took the handle on things and made changes in the rules that will help helping people right away now. And does it work to have courts earmarked for certain things <coughs> that will only deal with alcohol-related cases or deal with drug-related cases? Does that help the system move well, I, more efficiently? I think there are different ways to skin the cat. And um, we're a small state. 
Uh, we used to try to do a lot of this work even individually as judges on the bench. So whether it's a, a calendar that addresses it or a court per se, there are a lot of different models. The important thing is to develop a closer working relationship and oversight of an individual offender and then try to match services to that person's needs. I've seen amazing things happen when the court system believes in the power of change and telegraphs that uh, to offenders. So it's not simply just throwing services at people. It's really trying to meet them where they are and perhaps open some doors for them that they haven't opened for themselves in the past. And then to stay with them through that process and encourage them because hope is a really powerful motivator. Why are we so late to this? Was it thought that it had to be punishment? I, I think the war on drugs, which began under the Nixon administration back in the 70s, uh, was we got to get tough on people. The solution to our problems with drugs is, as opposed to two years in jail, it's got to be 20 years in jail. I think Justice Kennedy spoke before Congress and said, I've been sitting on the court a while. It's not working. Mm -hmm. So I think that, uh, you know, with the assistance of this group from Texas that came in and helped us out with it, they have done some work across the nation. Um, they basically took Rhode Island and kind of focused us, and J Judge Savage certainly focused us as well on, uh, let's work at this. I think there's a solution. It's not what we're doing now. And everybody's got to have some skin in the game and got to be <coughs> able to, to have some give and take. And that certainly exemplified itself through that process that I went through, as far as I'm concerned anyways. You looked at all the parties who were involved in it. You had the yeah. public defender, the attorney general, the mental health advocate. And you need that collaboration it it. It to have any sort of success. And you had representatives from the U.S. District Court in addition to the state court system. And the Department of Correction, they were really the main cog in the wheel because everything we implement, they're going to carry out. And obviously, A.T. War was a, a great uh, person to have on the uh, committee there. He was open and receptive to changes. So I know the Senate has passed your bills, the House is still working in committee. What else do these include? If, you, if you're sort of ticking off the, um, the goals for the committee, the initiative, what well, else? We, we have the diversion program that it will allow the Superior Court to create a diversion program right within the court system. Right now the Attorney General has a program, but this would put it right within the court system. In addition, we're changing the uh, way that we provide people who are victims of crimes funding and things of that nature. It will give them more money quicker, even if you are a, a, not the victim, but you're the per perpetrator of a crime. In another case right now, you're excluded out. This would allow them to get some of those services. And I know that was something that happened last year, that the fees were increased. These were both for moving expenses, so a victim could actually get out of the situation. And sadly, they were for burial, burial expenses, expenses for the family. So the the dollar amounts have gone up for both of those Correct. with your mm -hmm. legislation. Yes. And they're not funded by taxpayers' money. They're funded by fees and assessments that are paid by defendants who pass through the criminal justice system. So it wouldn't be any increase to the taxpayers at all. And this is all part of the <coughs> big puzzle that you have to worry about the victims yeah. mm -hmm. to make sure that the other things are going well. Mm -hmm. Yep. There's also a medical parole bill. Um, there are, according to A.T. Wall's testimony and concerns for his, not only his, uh, the inmates that he's in charge of, but also uh, for the state budget. Uh, we bear enormous uh, medical expenses for people who are, are on the last legs of life, so to speak. They're very ill. So we, this legislation will also create a way for uh, kind of a, a medical parole where people will be able to be released to the community and die in dignity versus dying inside the uh, walls of the ACI benefit to the state uh, other than just being you know a human being uh, and having some empathy is that we're not paying the medical bills and some of them are in the millions Wow. not to play the devil's advocate but wouldn't they be going somewhere else that would be state funded that we're still footing the bill for their expenses that's possible uh, you, that's a presumption that they live in Rhode Island uh, oh, or true. that they would stay in Rhode Island. True. Yeah. However, I think if they go to another place, they get, we get more federal reimbursement than we do if they're in the prison. Yep. But in the bigger picture, you are 
caring for this person oh, better yeah. than letting them stay in a jail cell. I agree. In addition, this isn't getting soft on crime either. The right. people who are the serious, hardcore criminals are going to get sentenced and heavy sentences imposed on them. This is for people who, for some reason or another, may have addictions, whether it's drugs, alcohol, or mental health. And we're going to address those concerns so that they don't end up as long-term career people at the Department of Corrections. <clears throat> so I'm curious, Judge Savage, if you had this diversion program when you were on the bench, could you see it making a difference immediately? Absolutely. I mean, there are offenders who need uh, diversion or treatment options every day. And we did a lot of it. We did the best we could with, within a limited structure and limited resources. And it's something that the community needs to be a partner with us on as well. In other words, we need more treatment options in the community to make this really work. But a lot of the legislation is focused, not all of it, but a lot of it's focused on front end solutions. In other words, what can we do to help people other than immediately incarcerate? And so the police under this legislation are given tools to divert offenders uh, with mental health issues at the, at the get-go um, because jail may be the only option sometimes if they're not given that authority. And then the courts are given the authority to divert and uh, align treatment with offenders. Then as you kind of go down the spectrum, the courts are also involved in terminating people's probation. If they have been very successful, then we can get rid of sort of that, you know, the handcuffs that remain on you on probation because we're holding a lot of people back from being successful in the community. A lot of um, ex-offenders will say doing time is easy but being locked out of society is really hard. And so with a criminal record, a felony record in particular, or being on probation, you may not get that job. You may not get the <coughs> second, the third, or the fourth um, job. Uh, you may not have housing. You may not be able to further your education. And so the chances of you going right back in, it's almost a setup for that uh, to happen. And I think um, this has been an amazing uh, effort, uh, as Chairman McCaffrey has indicated, between all branches of government. Um, I noticed today on the front page of the New York Times, uh, nationally, the huge organization of police chiefs and prosecutors nationally is calling for precisely what we have in this legislation. And that's 175 prosecutors and police chiefs across the land, led by states that you wouldn't necessarily expect, like Texas and Louisiana. Right. So we are really ahead of the curve. And I think the process of all branches of government being involved in this, and also how many hundreds of Rhode Islanders have been involved in this, uh, really has positioned us very well. Uh, to start doing some really good things. The other thing the legislation does is targets probation services to those at highest risk of reoffending. Instead of trying to be all things to all people, uh, we're going to try to target those services so that, again, we can make people more successful. Because making people more successful means fewer victims. And I would imagine that the probation officers that we currently have are overwhelmed. Well, there's 79 probation officers for almost 24,000 probationers. And if, if you limit the number of people on probation and kind of concentrate the time, it gives the probation officer services that are available more time to spend with someone as opposed to having cases that might last 20 years. Sure. So if you, and that's what some of what this legislation does, it limits the amount of t probation that someone could be sentenced to with an eye towards concentration of services at the time when people are most likely to reoffend. Reoffend as far as sobriety is concerned and reoffend as far as breaking the law is concerned. So when you're meeting with your committee and you're talking to the different branches, were people all accepting of this new mindset? Sort of like treating the individual and not throwing the book at them kind of thing. Is everyone there? I, I think that there's some that thought we, uh, this is a little utopic, um, but we all needed to be educated. I'm a former prosecutor. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, it certainly wasn't my mindset, although I saw cases where people didn't need a, a break. And I can remember uh, cases that uh, after I left the Attorney General's office, when I was before Judge Savage, and I remember one time she said to me, well, the sentencing guidelines are what they are. What, what do you want me to do? And there was a, hand, a set of handcuffs there. Handcuffs both in the law and handcuffs, handcuffs related to a mindset. I think we took the handcuffs off the criminal justice system and said, let's fix the problem. I know at some of the commission meetings, the discussions really got uh, heated between different parties who were interested in it, and they would really go through the issue. But at the end of the day, it flushed out, and everyone, even though they're not getting what they want 100%, they're getting a piece of the pie that thinks that helps makes it going to help make the system work better in the future. I know one of the biggest problems that we're facing in our state and really nationwide is the drug epidemic. Um, we've seen different attacks for this. A lot of people were just throwing them in jail and hoping that their time in jail would sober them up and have them quit their habit. And then there was the other thought, let's get them drug help right off the bat. And you've seen different successes. Um, there was this great story of a Texas jail where the warden said, I think we have to do things completely differently. And they're having incredible success by having these people enter drug treatment right away. So I, I imagine this is part of our goal here. Because if we get the people drug treatment, they don't have to become an ACI inmate. That's the goal. That's the goal. Uh, and when they're not an ACI inmate, there's a substantial savings to the state of Rhode Island, hopefully, in two ways. The person's not in prison, but also they're a productive member of society. So where does your committee go from here? I know we the legislation's drafted, passed in the Senate. Are you still meeting? Are you still collaborating with these the, other groups? The, the commission is not meeting any longer, although they have sent some assistance to us in our second year in trying to put this legislative package through. Uh, last year, the Senate passed it. The House did not pass it in a 3 o'clock in the morning decision. Um, but that won't happen this year. It I, is a priority for both. <coughs> I've heard that. Absolutely. <coughs> There's and no all question. the hearings have taken place in the House. So yep. How do you feel personally money. about this? Well, I think that um, it's wonderful when, when you can recognize a problem and then roll up your sleeves and get everyone around the table and begin to address it. You know, another part of this legislation really holds us accountable down the road. Does this work? Is what we're doing working? Can we do even better? And uh, it also provides for fiscal accountability so that if we pass criminal justice legislation in the future, we know what the cost is. We don't get into this situation of you know, spending an extra $100 million plus on a system that uh, really may be broken in many ways. So um, I'm just thrilled that so many people have come to the table and that so many Ro Rhode Islanders have felt invested uh, in this legislation and in this project. And we've heard from a lot of voices that frankly have never participated in our democracy. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Hopefully that investment will really spur things forward. Well, that's an interesting word to, to use in, in my opinion, is investment. I think we're making an investment in our economy by doing this. Mm -hmm. If we have, if people aren't the recipients of social services, then they're taxpayers. They'll have a job. We this one of the things about this diversion program that I just want to make sure that the listen, listening audi audience knows is the end goal is if you fulfill your promises as a defendant in this case, we'll dismiss the case. We'll erase it as though it didn't happen. As we, Mike and I, probably know, and maybe the judge knows from growing up, playing stickball or whatever, you had a do-over. You get to do it all sure. over again. This is a do-over, and in a, a do-over. That person can learn a lesson, say, whew, I dodged the bullet, go back and, you know, have a family and pay attention to life uh, and deal with life on life's terms. So I, right. I think it's that, that those will be taxpayers, not people who are on the, uh, on the public. Uh, and trough. when applying for a job, they would never have to check that, exactly. yes, I have a no. criminal background. Correct. Right. And yeah. over half of these offenders are nonviolent offenders. And it also is a way to free up more resources and target it toward the crime that we're most concerned about. So it's a balance across the board. All right. 
Well, thank you all for being here. Oh, thank you for having us. I know it goes by quickly. Um, Judge, <laughs> Justice, uh, Judge Judith Savage, and also I forgot to mention that you're both the chairman of your respective judiciary committees. Oh, not me. I'm chairman of labor. But chairman, oh, sorry. We're going we're gonna to promote you right now. Kale <laughs> Keeney. We'd be upset over that. <laughs> okay. Um, so, again, we've heard that the legislation has passed the Senate yes. floor. The House will be dealing with this. And there's also one re resolution in this entire package. And that is asking for the collaboration and the implement of the findings of this committee for all the other departments that are involved with this. Thanks so much for joining us for Legislative Insight. I'm Margie O'Brien. We'll see you again next time.